Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. Today I'm joined by a very special group indeed. Let's go around the horn. Chris Raygun taking school pictures in his bedroom with all those lights. <laughs> They're calling it these days. Set up. Uh, it sounds a little wrong, actually, when I say that, like like you're doing something wrong. Uh, I'm just saying you're doing something on the side. Right. Uh, w- welcome to the show. I, I am here. <laughs> I am here. I, I feel weird. It's been a while since I've been on Sacred Symbols Plus, so like I'm not sure. How, it's like a, it's kind of strange being back in some in some strange way. But well, welcome back to the show. Good to have you. How's your health? Uh, not bad. Not bad. You know, everything's kind of fine. I've just been I've been really working a lot on like just a bunch of extra stuff. So I'm a little bit. Uh, I think I'm a little bit overworking at the moment but i feel good at the same time so i'm not it's not really a problem right now (laughs) i'm sure it will be in like two weeks when i can't go to sleep at like a normal time but cross that bridge when i come to it well welcome to the show dustin Furman, executive producer welcome how are you good i just got done talking to a high school class about how we all of our company secrets about how we do things i don't know if we have any company secrets but i did talk to the youth, the next generation uh, about podcasting. So that was kind of fun. And uh, I also, you know, Chris, you mentioned about weird sleep thing. I have a weird, I'm, I don't know if it's just down the 30, but went to bed at 1130 twice mm. in the past few days. Woke up, not by just, just randomly, just woke up at like 730. I was like, well, I don't like this, but I also don't feel bad upon right. waking up. and then. The, we, the thing about waking up is that by the time you hit 11, 1130, you're like, wow, I basically lived an entire day already and it's not yeah. even lunch yet. <laughs> it's kind of I'm starting to, to to feel it. The power, you know, the old man power of waking up a little earlier. I was like, OK, there might be something going on here, but then I don't like it when it's, you know, 10, 30, 11 and I turn into a real sleepy boy. Don't like that. So, yeah, yeah. It has the its pros and cons. The exhaustion hitting at like noon is strange. Like it's like, oh man, I could t- I could take a nap right now. Yeah, and that's a strange experience because I you know I don't do that. <laughs> I'm not like a fucking three year old. But dude, you got to learn how to master the nap. Twenty minutes. No, the thing to me is like I can't. If I nap, then the the night is fucked. Because then I can't, I'm not going to be able to sleep at the at the at, at a time that's reasonable to fall asleep. Even at a twenty minute nap. A 20 minute nap seems so pointless to me because it's not it can't it, 20 minutes can't be enough sleep to gain any real to gain anything real from it to the point where it's like I might as well just power through this to the point where like I, I'll be really tired at night and I can fall asleep normal. That's I think there was I a time that I would have agreed with you mm. until I uh, I don't know. I, I, I've mastered the 20 minute nap and it, it's a big boost that really like do, do, do you really like get like a like a boost in power after that oh yeah you gotta do it right though the the ultimate nap is the coffee nap i don't know if you've heard of this it's you drink get a cup of coffee you drink it relatively quickly then lay down and it takes about 30 minutes for your body (laughs) to metabolize the caffeine so you get the rest and then you like you wake up and you're like ready to fuck shit up you know some of the craziest things dude the the funniest part about this is that Ben, I can see Ben going, pff, uh, pff. Ben, Ben has never slept a normal night in his fucking life. I don't want to see this kind of condescension, Ben. Okay. It wasn't condescension. I was just like, it was like disbelief. Like, I don't, I don't get it. There, you're, you're exaggerating my head movements. It's me taking in the idiocy of the things you're saying. Yeah. Me, meanwhile, when you say something on the, on the podcast, Dustin sometimes goes like, you know, like <laughs> you crazy gotta, face. I, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, meanwhile, he's, he's the one casting stones. You're talking I don't know about, about like, you know, thrusting deep or something you know well, how else am i supposed to react just fucking control yourself no oh. <laughs> that's not what they're paying us for colin no control mm. it's a good 311 song on no, on transistor no control did you see them on tiny desk i did yeah it was interesting to see that circulating first of all it was interesting to see them playing like 
60 percent as hard as they usually do on some of those songs because they're in that sp- tight space yeah. the drummer is even playing a traditional grip which he doesn't usually do to make the snare lighter which was cool because they're a very hard you know rock band but it was it was cool everyone seemed to be circulating this video which i thought was so funny and it was pretty good i thought i mean it's <laughs> like they played their four biggest songs so um it's not like stuff i really want to hear but, yeah, it's 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 tiny desk, you know, right. it's it's kind of, it kind of comes with the territory of like, yeah, these aren't going to be deep cuts. Mm-hmm. Dude, but some of those was, tiny desks, yeah. they only play new songs, though. And mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, you know, you got to sneak one or two of the hits in there. You yeah, can't you just can't do, do new ones. You can't, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was cool to see that them do that on 311 Day. And um, yeah, it was funny. Like, I'm so inoculated to the 311 discourse. Because as I said before, like everyone in my family makes fun of me for liking 311 so much um, since I was a kid. So like I'm just like, I don't really know, care. But it was interesting seeing like some people being like, wow, this is really good. And then some people being like, wow, it's weird seeing like 60 year old or 50 something year old men like doing rap rock songs still. Um, I'm like, yeah, that was kind of the danger of this. But, you know, it's I said I've said this before. I feel very fortunate that my favorite band of all time is the original lineup and they still play and they still tour and they still make records. I haven't I actually didn't listen to their last record, but, you know, they've been together for like 34 years or something like that. Thirty five years. It's pretty crazy without breaking up just Ooh. continuously. I think the longest they ever went without touring was a year. Like, they didn't tour really in 1998. In case you guys want to know your 311 uh, <laughs> lore. Um, What's in the history books? I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it was cool to see everyone kind of circulating that. And uh, a lot of people texted me it or DM me. it. So I appreciate you all thinking of me with that and i hope you enjoy you know they open with beautiful disaster and that's such a great song like that is such a good classic 311 song with that intro that guitar intro two guitars oh i'll tell you what all right my friends we're not here we're three, here to talk about something different 311 is an uplifting band that talks about being positive and loving yourself uh hell divers too is a game that encourages you to kill yourself for the cause <laughs> uh, i wanted to have one last conversation for now about hell divers before we kind of put a pin in it and the game will evolve no doubt in the months and years to come and so we'll revisit it i'm sure in the future but i spent an inordinate amount of time with this game this game has set my entire gaming schedule and fucked it up um i'm still like in the middle of final fantasy 7 remake because of this game so i haven't even picked up rebirth yet well i have picked it up i bought it but um and i've really really enjoyed it and you know it's not that hard for me to think to, to understand how this game att- was attractive to me um, I like shooters, so it's a very natural like I love shooters, so it's a very natural thing for me to just go one or two steps forward and it doesn't go too many steps forward where it's not PVP, which would be a total turnoff for me. I would never do that. And it was good to hear them say that they would never institute that. And the game is kind of fundamentally PVP, just kind of with the <laughs> with the things you could do to each other. And I, half the time I've died is because of someone else, not me, you know, not because of an enemy. But I wanted to go around the horn and and see how everyone's feeling about the game now. And I also asked everyone to kind of compile your some in-game statistics that I thought would be interesting to hear from everyone. We'll get to those in a moment. But let's go around and talk to everyone. Ben, let's start with you since you're yeah. our guest. Sure. Um, how, how are you liking Helldivers 2 now that we've been we've been kind of marinating with it and it's been out for a little while? People are still playing it. Hundreds of thousands of people at a time are still playing it. It seems to have sold somewhere between eight and nine million copies, which is incredible. And well in excess of sure of what they thought it was going to do, since they seem to refuse to really talk about it very much before it came out. So here we are. Uh, What have you to say? I'm really enjoying it. Uh, As far as, you know, Helldivers 1, I remember it. I played it for a little bit. I didn't play it anywhere near release. And uh, and I was like, not very, I don't know. I just wasn't super interested in Helldivers 2. And I'm not one to look at a bunch of marketing material either I, I usually don't watch trailers and but this was one of those games where it was like well this is going to be a fun one just to hang out and play with the boys like just whatever it's 40 bucks i can do that let's just get it and i've just been enamored with this game ever since you know the gameplay is fun all the time no matter what the scenarios are you know you go in and you do the same missions over and over but every one of them plays out differently and like that's a real strength of a of a game, especially a live service multiplayer game, to have the experience feel different every time. Uh, I've enjoyed the the fact that there's like no story, but there also is a story is really appealing because it seems like you can get as much or as little as you want out of that. Uh, the fact that they keep the community updated, the fact that 
you know, you're going to be in there with your buddies. Usually sometimes you're playing with randoms. That's fine too. Uh, and you just don't know what the play style is going to be. You know, one time you go in super clean, it seems easy. The next time you go in and you're just getting decimated and somebody drops a hell bomb on your head. And you know, the, the scenarios are just so different every single time. The guns feel great. Obviously there's tweaks and stuff that they've made and that they need to make, but no, I'm just really enjoying the game. And for a game that I was not expecting to like get super deep into, I've just been, I think enamored is the right word for me. Just really, really enjoying it. Loving it. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm the same way with the original where there's actually, I went and looked because someone sent it to me where I was like, dude, there's a video of you on IGN playing this game at Gamescom in Germany one year, like two years before it came out. And it is, there's a video of me playing it with these guys from Arrowhead. I don't remember. I, it's weird. Like someone could have just made this an AI. Like I don't remember this moment. I know yeah. I was there. Yeah. Right. And then I went yeah. and looked up, like I wrote a preview for it. And when the original came out, it took so long to come out. You guys might remember that it was supposed to be a PS4, PS3 and Vita game. And I don't even think they released the PS3 version or if they did, they just never really updated it. And then I played it a little bit on Vita, but not very much, like maybe fewer than 10 hours by the time it came out. So I don't have a, an, inordinate, an inordinate amount of experience with it either. I really loved I remember loving the whole notion of like how hardcore it is. It actually feels in some sense like that game was a little more hardcore. Hmm. than this game like I felt like I was dying way more in that game and that, that game was way harder but I could be misremembering they, both of the games are incredibly hard by the way all right Chris let's go to you um how are you feeling about the game uh now that we're what, what is it like a month and change now since we've had it something like that yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been I've been marinating on it for a while. To be fair, I've I've clocked uh, like significantly less hours into it over the last couple of weeks just out of sheer time <laughs> time crunch and and stuff like that on other projects, but it has still been in my mind and at the forefront of my mind. I tried and get at least one or two games in like if I can. And it's still it's been kind of a uh, a core a core uh, game for my my friends and I like I'll always get a text message like hell diving we hell diving and it's either yeah or no or whatever but like it's always it's weird to have that experience again because it's been a long time since I feel like I've had that specific experience with friends of mine who do play games but don't necessarily play as much as you know we do necessarily here at last stand or, or anywhere else it's like it's interesting and there's a lot of people who I haven't talked to in a while who jumped into it who like oh and i haven't talked to you since you know since i left for for la like eight years ago or whatever and, and now we're we're hanging out doing this nonsense it's fun it's good it's it's i like the fact that it's only pve i like the fact that it, they're not doing pvp I, th I think that would that would have been a real like i like pvp games but i just i don't feel like that would have been a, a great boon to the strength of this game i think the strength of this game is reminding a lot of people what we're what we're missing from I would argue some of the mid uh, 360 PS3 generation games where we had a lot of, you know, PVE focused experience, things like the, you know, Gears of War Horde mode and, and Left 4 Dead and, and, and these kinds of experiences that I think people have been hungry for for a long time that have been really, really underserved by the industry for uh, the longest time. Like we've had attempts to maybe overcomplicate things with like Evolve and and back for blood and and we we've seen attempts but they always do it wrong and and to to find some random sequel to this relatively obscure PS4 Vita game coming out way way after the fact and and kind of nailing exactly what it needs to be and what it needs to do and exactly the role that it needs to fill without overcomplicating it. I love the fact that there are different guns but there aren't like oh you got to attack you got to unlock a you got to attach an ACOG scope to this gun to it's like no 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 it's it's you get the gun and it's got different settings in the gun and you go and this is what this grenade does that's it you know you have some loose stat manipulation with like armor and stuff but it's it's still very very simple it's very easy to get your head around the thing that I really really that really captivates me about it I think is honestly just the fact that it is exactly as shallow and exactly as deep as it needs to be like it it doesn't overextend itself but it's very easy and approachable and so i think it lends itself to just this kind of casual 
this casual space just as well as it lends itself well to this like hardcore space where you're into in doing suicide missions and extracting under really really strenuous circumstances and so yeah no i'm i'm really enamored with it i think no question it's the game that i've had i would say probably the most genuine fun with in a while like where i'm laughing out loud as i'm playing and i'm I'm having a good time manipulating some of the mechanics like doing grenade glitches where i get one extra grenade because i i, I filled up on grenades through one and then picked up a grenade crate now i have seven out of six or whatever and and it works and and pinging objects through the door before i open it just to see if it's worth opening and but you could, that's definitely buggy and it's a little bit broken but it's None of it's broken in a way that I feel damages the experience. In fact, I think some of it's broken in a way that adds. So I don't know. It's I'm I'm enamored with it. I love it. Uh, easily the most fun I've had with a multiplayer game in a very very long time. And uh, I'm glad that we have co-op stuff like this again. Also, friendly fire is underrated, and I want it to come back in more things. I'm strange. I, I, I'm confused by the reluctance to include this because I, the chaos of it is is so entertaining there have been moments where i've been playing with people like because i play with just randoms where i'm like i'm gonna kick you out of the fucking game because you are so oh yeah yeah, yeah. at this you know like like no offense like i'm not gonna say anything to you or anything but just there was a dude a a mission where i think a dude killed me like seven or eight times and he wasn't griefing me like he just kept dropping like just yeah just like or thoughtless let's say you know like that's what i love about friendly fire is that you kind of have to there are times where my back's turned to an enemy, like a big enemy, and I'm like pull, calling up, like calling up a hell bomb. And and then I turn around and there's like one of my guys under him, like under the enemy or near the enemy. And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> but this guy was just, you know, throwing throwing caution to the wind. Um, Dusty boy. What about you? Yeah. What do you have to say? Yeah, I I want to echo a little bit about what Ben was saying in that I don't. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what my expectations were for this game going into it because the first game, a lot of cool original ideas, but uh, didn't, I don't want to say didn't grab me, but I, I think, you know, I, I had played some of it and then it just kind of fell away as many games do. And I think my biggest concern before this game came out was just that the original hell divers being a top down shooter. And now they were going to a full third person and it felt like a really risky move in that my biggest concern was just how the game was going to feel in terms of its play, whether or not this team going from a top down type shooter, going over to full third person in a much more triple a sense, how that was going to pan out. And so obviously when the game came out, it was pretty clear from day one that it was felt really fun to play. And I think the next big surprise is just how, it's it's a game that's gone beyond the success of our niche, but really broken into the mainstream where there are so many like hell divers memes. M- my favorite is the nice argument, but and that's like right down down for the, the hell bomb uh, or whatever. Uh, so there's like the memes and then just how I've heard about this from people that aren't necessarily in the super gamer hardcore space. My friend. Jason, he's kind of like my litmus test for more normie gamers, which he he plays a lot of stuff. He has a PS5, but he pretty early on was like, dude, I, I got to check out this game, Helldivers, and him and all of his boys play. I mentioned the classroom that I was talking to. One of the questions they asked me was about Helldivers and how much I was playing and if I had liked it. And so it's just, uh, it's clear. And this is something we were saying on Sacred Symbols is just that This game surely took Sony uh, and Arrowhead by surprise. I mean, that was evident by the amount of server space that they had ready. And I felt really bad for them in that situation because you don't want to necessarily dump all this money into server space uh, when you're not going to use it. You want to be responsible and have enough space, but not overextend yourself. And um, so, yeah, it, it sucked that they had a lot of issues with with servers, but I think the fact that I don't want to say they solved it quickly um, because there was kind of that whole weekend where it was super dicey. But in terms of like updating infrastructure of their game and then uh, it was quick enough that I don't think it severely damaged the game. It wasn't like a 
Master Chief collection situation oh, no. where <laughs> you're you're looking at a, a month plus waiting to club. just Oh yeah, or Drive Club. So in terms of those, it was fast enough. And I think that that's what's most important. My biggest question just now about the game is how quickly um, and how drastically they're going to change stuff just because they've already went and, you know, we're starting to see the mechs get involved, the the new mode. There's now environmental type things that they're adding as far as the meteors and the, the flame tornadoes. And all those have been cool. I just wonder... Um, and I'm sure this is the question that all live service developers have to ask themselves is like, what's the cadence? What's the perfect amount of drip feed where you keep people invested, but you also want to do big things at the same time that people are naturally going to fade away and come back. What is the cadence for that? And I think that's kind of the biggest question. And, and also too, just in terms of balancing the game, which I think is probably their biggest, uh, I not mean necessarily issue, but biggest hurdle right now is figuring out how to balance weapons along with the weapons and the many, many modes of difficulty. Let me pull on the thread trying to we've talked about this game so extensively that I want to try to find a few new things to say about it. And just to kind of pull on that thread with Sony and Arrowhead. On one hand. So eight million copies at, at forty dollars is three hundred and twenty million dollars gross. And it's going to be a, a lot less than that because Steam's going to take a lot of that. But on PlayStation, they're going to make all of that. On one hand, it shows how how woefully insufficient that is. <laughs> like, I know that sounds crazy to people, but that's that's awesome. That's an amazing success. I'm going to get to like the positive in a minute. So don't don't cut my head off yet. But it's like on one hand, this is what I'm talking about. This is not the game they're looking for. It's not. Um, the The amount of money made, let's call it. After Steam takes their cut, let's call it like 250 million, 250 million gross. Arrowhead made the game for eight years. They scaled up to about 100 people. They're in Europe. It's expensive. So you're like, you see the money whittling away. Plus, they made these really bold proclamations, which I think were a, b- a big mistake, although I don't, I don't think they knew how well the game was going to do, where they were like basically saying, like, we're just going to support it for free. You know, um, and I know you can get out of that by doing a bunch of different things, and they will. They're certainly going to have paid support for the game. Um, so with all of that said, on one hand, it's like, wow, this is an amazing success. And yet look at the mountain that they're trying to climb. It's not the one, but, and it's not, but I think that there's this major upside and it's obvious in some way, but I actually think Sony's hesitance to say anything about the game is part of it. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I mean, at the time we're recording, Sony has said basically nothing about this game. They tweet about it every once in a while or whatever, but they have if your game sold eight million copies, you'd think you would say it. In some yeah. sense, I feel like they're saying, like, let's just let this thing be. And certainly they're going to have things to say at their financials and all of the rest. I'm sure that's when they'll have numbers like updated numbers. But it seems like they kind of just want it to be taken by its own inertia and lean into kind of its agnosticism in some way. It's not really it is a PlayStation game, but we're seeing the magic of the PlayStation game when you put it day and date on PC. It would be big still, but it wouldn't be as visible. There wouldn't be things like look at the fucking player count on Steam DB or something like we would never know. We would just never know. We would just assume and then we would get Bloomberg articles about maybe it's selling four or five million copies. Still an amazing um, thing, but in some way you have to kind of level it out and be like, yeah, this is a great success. One that snuck up on them, obviously one that they're going to be able to garner money from in the long term, but one that I think maybe most powerfully is going to give them that little, as the term I like to use, that little je ne sais quoi in multiplayer gaming, where it's like, oh, we can do this. Like our actual first major, from their perspective, our first major try in years since, you know, Kill Strain and Drawn the Death and everything is a major success. And it's a second party game. If I were at Haven and Firewalk with Concord and Fair Games, I'd be looking at that and thinking, what can we learn from them? Like, this seemed to be kind of the leadoff hitter, but actually it's like the cleanup hitter. Like, this is doing really, really well. So I just think from a business point of view, I'd love to be a fly in the wall at Sony to know how they're choosing to manage this game. Because you have to understand in some sense, and it goes all the way back to the to the mid PS3 era, like they've been with Arrowhead for a long time making this series. And it's like, why? That someone said that earlier, it might have been Ben. It's like, 
why are you what is it about this weird niche game that you were enamored with in some way to the point where you let them take almost eight years to make the second game eight years Mm. now it's not a huge expense you're buying the milk right I don't know. I would just love to know over the years, like what what made you so confident in the original one? What made you want to sign them again? What made you they let so many games walk away in the second party? Think about it like that game wild, right? That game just disappeared off the face of the planet. No one knows what happened to that game. Um, But they were like, no, let's reboot this game. Let's stick with it. But then we're not really going to talk about it. We're not going to show a hell of a lot of confidence in it. No open betas, no demos, right? Like We're just going to release it and it's going to become this thing. And by the way, it's not going to be ready to go as we noted or Dustin, especially like at prime. It's not ready for prime time, by the way, by the way. And also it's on this really old archaic engine that is no longer supported. Yeah. Very weird series of choices and extricating that game from that engine is going to be impossible. So now they're stuck with this thing. This can be a 10 year game for all we know. I, I'm so fascinated by that. I think the engine shut down in 2018 or something like something weird like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of like minutia around the game that I think is just as fascinating as the game itself. And that says a lot because the game is a ver- of a very high quality. I think it's so early, but like clearly this is the game of the year for me so far. Like this will be the game to beat. And there's plenty of opportunities. I haven't played Rebirth yet. I haven't played Pacific Drive. There's a bunch of games coming out, you know. Um, Calling on the financial yeah. piece. Yeah, please. I definitely hear you, and I think you're right about, you know, what, what's 250, 300 million in the current landscape. But right, I think that, that, that's Spider-Man's, that's Spider-Man 2's budget. Right, yeah. You know? and, and I think that's, that's accurate, but also I don't think the... Um, I don't think the power of the microtransaction in a, in a $40 game can be overstated because, y- you know, you have people like me who are like, yeah, I'll pay 40 bucks. And after the first night of play and we're like, okay, yeah, 10 bucks more. This is awesome. This game's awesome. Uh, you have plenty of people I see all the time, you know, we get a rando in, in the squad and I see all the time people wearing stuff out of the superstore that cost credits. And I know you can earn those credits in game, um, but I'm talking even like within the first week, I saw a lot of stuff coming out that was in the war bond or the battle pass or whatever people want to call it, but that was, that was in there. So I don't, obviously that's not, you know, that's not selling the game again, money right off the bat, Mm -hmm. but I think it's in terms of the long-term supports and let's say they do decide to support it for free uh, going forward. You know, if you've got, if you still got every time you put out a war bond, you still got half a million people buying that. That's a good chunk of change right there Um, because free to play it's not free to play, but you, but like live service, the real money long term, I, I really think is in the, the microtransactions. And if you can keep people engaged, if you can keep that drip content at the right amount, the right, the right, if you can time it so that your new piece of paid content comes out about the time most people are finishing up the last piece, if it's a good game, people are going to keep doing it. And we see that with other, there's obviously a thousand misses for every one success. But we see that constantly with games. You're like, how is this game staying afloat? Oh, it's because they have a store in game and people are just continuing to dump probably more money than they paid for the game of, into it over the course of time. So yeah, I think you're fair, right fair overall. Yeah. I think you're right overall. I just think there is that piece that they might have only made $250 million in sales, but I, I can, I, I'll bet you that they've made half that again already in microtransactions. I hope so, just because I feel like you're absolutely right. It's a wonderful point taken totally. But also, I think that they've been the the microtransactions are so passive in Mm -hmm. my I mean, and I don't have a lot of experience in this space, but from my perspective where I'm like, I'm not even really sure how this works. Like, that's how unassuming it is, where I think I've earned almost a thousand of those credits just by buying them in the war bonds or whatever. Um, Yeah. And I think I use some I think the armor I use and I'll talk about my armor in a little while, I think was purchased out of the store at some point. And it was like a one, you know, once like once one time only kind of thing for a, c- a certain amount of time. But I'm not even sure like the microtransactions are so un- unobtrusive that I'm not even really sure how it works. Mm-hmm. Like I know like I'm I keep just unlocking all of the normal metal stuff like the M.E.D.A.L. Like using the metals to unlock all the normal stuff to the point where I'm like, I hope that at the end of this, I just unlock the next tier without having to buy into it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's like just the way I'm playing. Like so I'm unlocking a bunch of things I don't even want just to 
fulfill these quotas so I can get to the bottom of the list. Um, so I, I think that that's, there's something very, um, there's something really nice about that because they didn't have to really do it like that. It could be much more annoying and maybe that would turn against the game. Maybe this is a very finely calibrated game more than we can possibly imagine from that perspective. But I, uh, I will say that just to put a finer point on what, why I mean, why this isn't the game they, because some people will be like, that's a lot of money and you're right. They can make a lot of money doing this. It's just that I struggle to think of the game that I think they're chasing that you pay for like upfront, like that's, they're all free. All the games they're chasing are free. And then the games, I think beyond that, that would make a lot of money. Arguably could be subscription based games like MMOs and games that just churn tons of money that way. I feel like this is almost the third space you'd want to be in. So while I think that they're excited to have this really successful a la carte double a style multiplayer game i still think it's not the environment they really want to be in uh well and they're happy to be here too of course but it's just yeah. one opportunity cost and it's been massively successful so i don't want to understate that i think you're absolutely right um all right let's go around let's get some of these st- i asked you guys to just compile some stats and i want to just we'll go we're not going to name them all at one time but i just want to kind of go through and see how much everyone's played so um Dustin, how many missions have you? Well, you know, actually, what's your player level? Let's start 24. there. 24. 24? Dusty's 24. How about you, Ben? 34. 34 for Jesus Ben. Jesus Christ. Chris. I'm still 18, man. 18. I'm green. You're legal. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, Chris. I'm level 30. So it's interesting. We're all kind of scattered. I'm a death captain. By the way, I love yep. I love like unlocking that every five and then immediately going in and updating that that title. Yeah. Death Captain. Yeah, so it's no. the level I'm level thirty awesome. Death Captain. How many missions have you played, Dustin? Ninety seven. How about you, Ben? One hundred and sixty. One hundred. Wow, one sixty. And for you, Chris. Sixty seven. Sixty seven. Yeah, this, I mean, this is all panning out. I mean, based yep. on our levels, I played one hundred and five. It's interesting. We're all kind of scattered, but. Like uh, uh, the next rung up the ladder, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like four brothers that are only a year apart from each other, as it were. <laughs> um, all right. Now, let's re- I, I'm really interested to see everyone's numbers here because I'm not I suspect I always I don't know if you guys go when you get back to your ship, press square and you can see everyone's stats. And then, yeah. up, you know, and I always look at that. Because mm-hmm. I just want to feel like I wasn't the worst player. Yeah. <laughs> and often I'm not. Although I'm playing much harder missions with a lot of a lot of I'm encountering a ton of level 50 people like like mm. often one or two in every game I play and they're just really, really good. So like I'm often the, the third or few and fourth. On, in, but I just try to stay alive and get my kills. But let's talk about kills and deaths. Um, Dustin, let's start with you. My kills are seven thousand seven hundred sixty four. And my deaths are 258. Okay, very well. Ben? Kills 24,177. Uh, I don't know how it's so substantially more than Dustin's, honestly. Uh, and deaths, 326. 326, okay. Ben, I think the part of that, sorry to jump in in the middle, but I the way I play is that I, I kind of often take the lead on pressing buttons and doing the console stuff. I think, oh. and so, I think what you mean by that is that you get carried a lot. Eh, you could, I mean, that's <laughs> one way you could look at it. But when no one's going on the fucking console. Yeah, I would. Like someone's yeah. got to do it. Someone's yeah, got to do it. Yeah. Sometimes that shit pisses me off because I especially I don't talk to anyone where it's like, is anyone going to do the task? Yeah. 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 Like there are, ma- where, there are maps where I'm like, we're all in like four corners of the entire map. Oh, no. You know, like. Yeah. No. yeah. That doesn't happen often, but don't worry. No. Sorry. I'm just doing some kill to death ratios here. So, Dustin, it says here your kill to death ratio is roughly 30 to 1. Nice. Ben, I wish that was mine in COD. <laughs> uh, <laughs> dude, if I can keep a 1 in COD, I'm, I'm amped. Yeah. Uh, divided by... Yours is 74 to 1, Ben? Cool. And then, Chris, what are your numbers here? I think about half my deaths, by the way, are because of Lockmart, but that's the difference. Oh. Oh, yeah. wait until I tell you how many times I've died. So you can- <laughs> is there is there a, is there a friendly fire stat? Because I know there is in, in the, in the post game stat screen, but I, I couldn't find it in like the. the yeah, overall. if it's not in that, if it's not in that one list, I don't think it's probably counted would, or it's not counted ah, for man. us. That's a shame. It is be, a shame just because it would be cool to know stat. how many times you died for real. You know? Yeah, right. All of those are yeah. real deaths, I guess. Yeah. 
I want to know how much friendly fire I inflicted is, is my curiosity. Oh, I see. You know, but uh, so my kills are uh, 7,852 mm-hmm. um, and then deaths are 167. So Chris right, has more kills nice. than so me. So 7, 8, 5, 2. So 47 to 1. All right. You ready for mine? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I have 14,446 kills. So pretty nice, but I've mm-hmm. died 353 times. So more than even Ben having killed 10,000 more, ma- giving me six divided by, sorry, I'm doing this live, is 41 to one. So I think your, your kill to death ratio is the worst, Dustin, but that it's because sense. like you said, you're taking a passive gray magic support. Yeah. <laughs> you're <laughs> casting thing- time magic and doing all this. I really liked it early on. I was always taking the sniper in or oh, and then yeah. I was switching to like the railgun. And so I was really focusing on big enemies. Mm-hmm. But yeah. there's no. no stat for that. No, um, it's true because I, I often. Well, we'll get into it. Yeah. All right. So that, I just thought that would be interesting. So Ben dominant 74 to one death kill to death mm-hmm. ratio. Chris, a very respectable 47 to one kill to death ratio. A much less respectable 41 to one for me. And then Dustin, 30 to one. We got to clean that up a little bit. Skill issue. A little bit. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you can see I've died more than all of you because I'm I'm sure out of the four, but I am sure out of the four of us, I am the worst player. Well, I think you're also the only one who predominantly plays with randos. And I think randos kill you a lot more than your teammates, at least on accident. Yeah, that's objectively like that must be the reason because the only time that you know, I'm I'm not just trying to, to, to protect my my poor reputation in games, but I do feel like I've died less fewer than half the times I died because of like an enemy. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. like literally seven, eight deaths sometimes in a match because of like one person just being right, not knowing, you know, or being a dickhead. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. The only time I've ever the only the few times where I've played with randos or even just with teammates without mics because I'm just like I have people over or whatever or I'm just doing something else or I'm listening to something. Uh. That is when I die the most from other teammates because there's no communication, mm-hmm. and it's just like, well, all right, this is this is gonna be a it's gonna be a graveyard shift. This this mission. I only I've only got I think only gone a f- well, I've gotten I guess quite a few missions without dying, but at the highest levels that I played, like seven is the the level I play at now. I did survive one whole thing without dying, like a forty minute match, and I was annoyed because you get that trophy if everyone survives, and I'm like, how did I do it? Yeah. And no one, you know, but it was just a lucky thing. I've already had people reach out saying, like, Colin, we'll carry you through. Like, I have three friends, two friends we play with, and we'll just carry you through and get those trophies. And, like, maybe it would be funny to have the Helldivers true play, two platinum. All right. In mission time, I was curious how much everyone's played in mission. Um, Dustin, what does yours say? 23 hours, 36 minutes. Okay. Ben? I'm really hesitant to say this out loud, but 46 yeah. hours, 44 minutes, 46, 44. Yeah, that's that's those are big boy numbers right there. Chris. Yeah, yeah. I had a uh, I didn't get the minutes, but I had 20, 20 hours, basically 20 hours. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Mine is 34 hours and 44 minutes. So, yeah, that that makes sense. Now, I wanted to ask this next one, though. Just to see how important this is to you, this is a fairly important thing to me, but I realize that when I get in the shit, I just lose sight of it halfway through the mission, and then I'm, I'm usually not the one getting out of these missions. I wanted to see how many samples you've collected. Dustin? 254. You're going to have to pick it up, I think, a little bit with that. That's not that's not sufficient. I'll just tell you that right now. Okay. Ben? 780. <laughs> ben is the sample collector, if anyone dies. He's or going. I'm very intentional if I die and have all the samples to make sure someone else picks them up. Um, Chris. Uh, 275. Okay, so this is, a, this is an interesting change here. I've collected 726. So almost as many as Ben. That's interesting. Like a little patsy out there. Trying yeah. to find those little. I have never. I've been around where you've cracked. You crack open and find the really rare pink um, mm-hmm. currency, but I've never. I've never once held the pink currency myself. Oh, 
All right, let's get into these final things. I want to know how many successful extractions you've had and how many missions you've won. Uh, Dustin. I'm going to double check my numbers and boot up because this doesn't sound right. I've su- successfully extracted 48 times. Missions won 88 times. Okay. That doesn't sound right, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you here. I'm going to explain what I think that I, what I think the successful extraction means, because I don't. Um, I don't know for sure, but then my number is yeah. low too. Ben. What is your say? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Uh, 72 successful extractions, 147 missions, one. And there's no way I died 70 times more than I and didn't. Ext- there's no way I didn't extract 70 times. Right. The missions I've won. Yeah. Chris, what is your say? Uh, so successful extractions is 31 and then missions one is 57. Yeah. OK. Well, Ben, what is your understanding okay. of this? I, I was thinking that is it is it counting when you do everything like, you know, like when you, a, a, a successful extraction would be like you did all the main main missions, you did all the blue, like the light blue icon missions. I would think an out. extraction is when you get on the ship and leave. So whatever it takes to do that. So realistically, just your main mission and leaving and not dying before the ship takes off. That would be a, an extraction in my mind. Yeah. So but it can't be that right. Like we That's all- what, I, I think that stats bugged and I know they're like the friendly fire on the end screen. There have been times I've shot a teammate intentionally, like goofing around with my buddies, shot a teammate intentionally and they get to the end screen and it says zero friendly fire. So like there's some stats in here that may not be 100 percent. I think most of them are pretty good. But Yeah, I didn't even know that that it was considered bugged. Like I was looking at it and being like, what is it trying to say? Like, I don't know if it's considered it, bugged. I yeah. just think it's wrong. Yeah, personally, I don't know if that's predominant. All Seems right, to I'm be ex- with us or at least, though, I'm excited to see this. I want to know everyone's loadouts. First of all, let's start with preferred weapon loadouts. By the way, have you guys encountered? I've had this bug for probably two weeks now where the game does not remember my settings yeah. and it's driving me fucking insane because sometimes I'll just go right into a mission and then I'll have like weapons I don't want. I'm like, God damn it. This is not I don't know what what that's all about. I hope that they are able to fix that soon. But uh, Dustin, let's go to you. What's your preferred weapon loadout? So, you know, your primary weapon, your secondary weapon and your grenade. My primary weapon of choice is the SMG 37 Defender. That's the submachine gun. Secondary is the P19 Redeemer. That's the fully automatic pistol. And then I'm just rocking the standard grenade. I was trying to use the impact, but I kept missing my shots, throwing them into bug holes. So I'm just back on the normal grenade. Um, What about you, Ben? What is your preferred loadout primary secondary grenade? My, fir- my preferred primary is the breaker um, by a long shot. Uh, the my secondary, I use the, the the senator, which is the like six shot revolver. I don't really like it, but I like it better than any of the rest of them because mm-hmm. in a like it'll it'll put them down if they're charging and I don't have anything else. And then for grenades, it depends on what kind of mission I'm doing. I either go for the impact or the high explosive. Um, whether it's, you know, whether I'm going for bug holes or whether I'm going for a different type of mission. So it just depends on the situation. I don't always change that up, but those are the two that I probably cycle between the most. And what about you, Chris? What's your uh, loadout? I've I've pretty consistently stuck with... I, I have not found a gun that feels as good as just the first liberator that you get i really i really love that gun i love that it's versatile that it has like all these different firing modes and like i tried to i tried to switch to the what is it the penetrating one the but it's i don't like the burst fire on it it just doesn't feel i don't feel like i have enough control over it so i've been running with just the the liberator the redeemer that uzi uh Mm -hmm. that semi-automatic pistol because it is really just pretty fucking good and i've been pretty consistently like since i impact impact since i unlocked impact grenades i haven't switched back because i just find them too like you got to be really careful with them because sometimes some bug will jump in front of you and then and then then you'll get blown across the map but i just find it too effective uh especially when you're if you're running into like a a bug hole nest and you could just like get pop 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 and if you get if you know exactly where to aim it's it's you can clear those things out really quickly before anything else spawns and you don't have to wait for the timer on the grenade to go off. So that's, that's been my, my run pretty consistently since I've unlocked all those individual weapons. For me, uh, I'm with you, Ben, where the breaker is like, I'm pretty sure they nerfed the breaker. They did. Yeah. Um, which was a really a bummer. Cause I had like a real like feel of it about like how many bullets you can fire. And then 
real, but that thing is, I don't understand how, like if it's supposed to be that powerful still, or if they're just like, yeah, we'll just let it, let it go. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. It's a shotgun yeah. with no I, distance, like ramifications at all. in using it. I've my switched to the other, there's two other types of breakers that I have unlocked. One's the incendiary and one's called the, the run and gun. And even though they're breakers, you know, they're the same base model, essentially like I can't, and, and I don't, I hate the electronic or not the electronic, but the um, the weapons that like shoot electricity or whatever they are. Uh, I hate those. And the other ones just don't seem to do enough firepower. But yeah, the breaker all the way for me. And then, yeah, I'm, I use the Uzi too, the Redeemer. That's a, a great secondary weapon. I use it pretty often. I find myself in situations where I need it. And then, yeah, the, D, the G12 high explosive. Now, I don't think I'm, I really excel at very much in this game. To be perfectly honest with you, I think I'm good. I think I can carry my my weight. But one thing I'm really good at is hitting these ridiculously long distance grenade shots into the bug holes. For yeah. some reason, I just like as like to the point where I try it so far away where the grenade explodes before it even gets to the hole, but it was totally going to go in to the hole. And I don't know why I'm so good at that, but that's like kind. Of, so I'll stay like on a ridge and just kind of like lob these things. But it's a bummer. You only get four of them and then you have to kind of go run around and find a, a replacement. So yeah, I, I go with the G12 high explosive as well. What about armor setups? Now, of course, there's so many pieces of armor. I don't expect people to know exactly what you're talking about, but I was curious if you wanted to describe your armor. I, I want to go first here just because I, I feel like I've only encountered one other person that even has the armor I have. And I wonder if it was just available for this ephemeral amount of time or something. Because or, if, But it's this like, I, I, I unlocked it pretty early. It's like a blue, just like a bright blue armor. And I think I used some of the credits you earn like in every every level you or every little, little tier. You can get like 50 credits with your medals. So I never bought any credits, but I think I used some of them to, to buy this armor. And it's funny. I was reading the description before we start. They're called the TR7 ambassador of the brand. Do you guys mm. know this? this armor? And it's if you read the description, it's funny. It's for like a yogurt marketing campaign. That's a pre-order set, by the way. Oh, it, oh, it, oh, it is. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Okay, so that's I, I, dude, I didn't even know that because I was like, what? Are, and what? I love blue. It's like yeah. the color of um, Dustin's car. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I find that ele- almost that electric blue very attractive. And I, but I didn't know. That's funny. That that's funny. What that's what it is. I didn't know that that was like. I didn't even read the description until today because I wanted to find some more information about it. So yeah, so the TR seven ambassador of the brand. I wear the armor and the helmet. And then the uh, cape I wear, I think I unlock just in one of the regular war bond tiers, which is Tide Turner. And it's like an orange cape. So I got a little bit of an Islanders thing going on or whatever. But I one of the one of the fun things I think about the game that adds a lot of intensity to it is like when you you're covered in blood and dirt and yeah. everything, the further the game goes on. And it looks so cool on that bright mar- like it's marketing armor. It wasn't made to be even be used, basically. And I just think it's uh Really cool. So that's my setup. Dustin, what's your armor setup? My armor setup is, let's see, I wrote it down here. The B24 Enforcer. And this is from the Superstore, but I used my, you know, the standard credit that you get from the free pass to get it. And the reason I got it, just because I think it looks cool. It's white. It's got a red visor. It's kind of uh, Stormtrooper-esque. And yeah, I... And was really glad because some of the armor that I've got that I think looks really cool is either light or heavy armor. And I can't stand using either one of those because too squishy with light and then the heavy armor, you're just so slow. So always rocking the standard. But I am jealous of the uh, the yogurt armor armor. Yeah. That was a pre-order because I I didn't pre-order because I was worried the game was going to be broken at launch on PC, which <laughs> Ended up being kind of broken no matter what, but the first that week is was pretty good, cool. But yeah, I, I shouldn't give myself any credit for pre-ordering it. By the way, I literally just when I know that a game when a, when a game on the PSN that's coming out has a little time icon next to it, it means mm-hmm. it's preloading, right? And then I'll yeah. pre-order it at that point to like just download it. So I didn't even know what I was getting. I have yeah. I have thought about getting the upgrade with like, but I don't even know. I don't I don't know. I'm I'm yeah. happy with just. I don't want to be cheap, but it's like I, I'm happy. Like I, I'm getting a lot of value mm-hmm. out of forty dollars. It's like okay, I'm good. I don't need to spend any more. All right, Benjamin, let's hear your uh, armor setup. Describe it to us. I am rocking the TR9 Cavalier of Democracy, which is also <laughs> uh, which I love the name. 
It's also a pre-order set, although I did not pre-order the game. Um, I had a gift card for uh, Aniba, which is kind of like CD keys. Um, so I bought it on there. Um, and even though I bought it the day it released, they st- the code they gave me was for the pre-order. So I didn't actually get the pre-order, but I got the armor that went with it. Cool. Um, and it's uh, it's a medium armor. And uh, it, there's other armors that have these stats, but it's um, it's got the democracy protects set up. 50% chance not to die, and it prevents bleeding if you get a hit in the chest. So there's other armors that have that ability, but I, I'm with Dustin. I can't stand the light armor. I die too quick, and the the other... One thing I cannot stand in any game, I, I hate stamina bars, and the fact that the heavy armor just kills your stamina. I don't care if I live longer. I want to run fast, so... Yeah. I got to run fast. I'm always running away. Run fast. I'm yeah. always running away. Like, <laughs> I'm always in some some <laughs> state of disarray, you know? Like, I'm always running from from my teammates, honestly. And we'll lock more specifically. Yeah, specifically. Oh, yeah. dude, Locke's the worst. He's the worst team killer. <laughs> He's I always, always feel throwing... like I'm paying in my heart when you, like, I throw a bomb or whatever, yeah. and then you see the explosion, and then immediately one of the names goes red or whatever, yeah. and I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, th- the thing you can do to redeem yourself is immediately bring them back. Mm-hmm. Immediately call them back. Because there's right. sometimes when somebody will kill you and they're like, I'll get you back in a minute. And it's like, hey, it's been it's been three or four minutes now. Are you what are you doing? You've had a second. I'm sure of it. I also try to get people back in just as an advantage. Like, yeah. And even occasionally do kamikaze stuff myself where it's like, I want to die here. Br- call me back in so I can land on top of this. Yeah. Yeah. And destroy from space. Every all oh, that that feels so good. Anyway, Chris. Let's hear about your armor setup here. Yeah, so uh, I've been I switch I, depending on what we're doing. I switch between two specific armors, but they're, but it's both light because I need I need the speed. I know I feel like I have enough control over my character. Where it's like I can avoid enough damage if I'm like if I'm just paying attention. So it's like I, I and I can't. I'm like you guys were like I cannot go slow. Mm. I can't. I can't do heavy. I can't do it. And even medium is like a little too. A little too slow for me, so I've been I've been mostly going with the CE seventy four breaker, which is like this kind of red and beige. It looks kind of it looks vaguely Star Warsy, honestly. But uh, that's like it gives you two extra grenades, and then oh really? So you have six grenades? That's cool. Yeah, so I have six grenades, and then if you do the grenade grits, you can have seven. So it's like it's stupid strong. (laughs) So I've been using that, and then on automaton missions i've just been using the infiltrator because it just makes you really hard to see and it's really useful for that specific enemy but the helmet i have uh what is it the sa 25 steel trooper it's like a it's like a normal looking helmet but it's got a red eye it's almost got like a red scouter looking thing and then the cape is the the cape of stars and suffrage (laughs) which is like green (laughs) and white and red it's got a cool insignia on the back it's 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 pretty dope I, I I'm pretty happy with the armor variety and the fact that there's like some uh the f- I love the fact that there are s- stats only on the armor and not like the helmets or, or the or the capes kind of gives you yeah. a little bit of freedom. That was a wise decision, I think. Hmm. But yeah. Do you guys feel uh, I've seen some of this leveraged? I don't know. Was it IGN that was saying this recently or something like that? That this game is pay to win. I don't know. I don't really. Ag- I did. I see didn't that. know PVE could even be pay to win. I, I thought pay, pay to win was more of a PVP thing, right? Like I, I voiced or, this on summon sign. I have a real problem, even though I think this game is great and the way the monetization works, I think is, is good. I have a real problem with the fact that there are weapons locked behind the premium war bond. So like just I don't mind grinding to unlock something, but the fact that you have to pay to unlock the ability to grind for something. I don't like that. Now, with that said, I've tried the weapons I've unlocked thus far in the premium war bond, and I think they suck. So like, and I know you can earn the credits in game to unlock it. So technically you don't have to shell out more money if you don't want to. So I think in that respect, some people, if they prefer those weapons would say pay to win. I mean, I think that's just an easy way to say it. Obviously it's, it's co-op. So there's no advantage over other players, but I understand the sentiment because there are there is, there is the fact that you can't use certain weapons unless you pay them more money, but yeah. I don't think those weapons are worth using anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. All right, I want to. I'm really excited to see this because this is where I think things will get a little bit more dynamic. Indeed, 
Um, actually, before I get over that, I, let, me, let me read this note real quick that I wrote about crossover since we're talking about armor. I'm sorry. Let me get to this first. Are there any like armors you want ingested into the game from certain licenses or IP? Like, mm-hmm. I just feel like you, you're going to they're going to get me so hard with a kill zone, um, like hell gas armor or something like I'm going to be all all about that. Is there anything you guys they'll get my money on that when mm-hmm. that that that's inevitable, right? You have to assume kill zone. Yeah. Or do they not want to go down that road? I don't know. I don't think they'll go down that road. Yeah, I don't know. And because I just it, it's so coherent together, you know, like, yeah, um, it's begging for the hell. I Ben, I mean, I think I said on one of the episodes of Sacred, even that it's like it would be even crazy if they did like a DLC where like the hell gas were one of the yeah, like the factions, which would be fucking crazy and yeah. sick, you know, um, wouldn't really make any sense or the chimera would be mm-hmm. another one from resistance are you guys inter- interested in any of that stuff or are you good because uh, someone said earlier like it looks like a stormtrooper and i was like oh biker scout armor would be kind of cool yeah, yeah mm. some of like that i don't really have any desire or need for any kind of integration with any other property but i do think one that would be cool that would break the world is if they did a, a master chief set but of course that that's not an xbox yeah, yeah. i'm sure that's not going to happen with the brand association but that's the only one I can think makes sense. Like I was thinking in my head, like, oh, you kind of feel like Iron Man and the Iron Man armor would work, except for the, the fact that you can't jump or fly. So, yeah, I don't I don't have any need or desire for it, but I'm all for whatever they want to put in there. And they could they could charge 10 bucks a piece easy for for some of the bigger brands, I think. Yeah, the license, yeah. The, I think the licensing possibilities even outside yeah are, are rife yeah. right here if I, I do wonder if like some gamer executive somewhere at some nerdy company is like we want to get in on this oh yeah our brand x and this will make a lot of sense yeah and, and it would go with the satire of the hell divers for sure right put, a, yeah. put an x on suit in there or something <laughs> well as people have pointed out to me because we were wondering about this what was that like tristar so basically sony owns the the film rights to mm-hmm. to starship troopers even Mm -hmm. So do you want to get literal in some Mm -hmm. sense? Because that is kind of what they're imbibing, at least the movie, not the book. Mm -hmm. All right. I hope they do. uh, I was thinking, I know people leans into my weebish tendencies, but I think of Chris from Halo 3, the Hayabusa, right? Armor that was like. Oh, yeah. The So you could do a uh, like Ghost of Tsushima samurai Mm -hmm. style armor. That would be super cool. But uh, other than armor, I don't I don't think the crossover would go much further than that. But the Hellcast, man, that is such a cool idea. Again, I don't know if they'd want to open up that uh, can of worms, but it would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I, I feel like it's they have a unique opportunity to really open this game up to a lot of different IPs if they really wanted to. I think like like Ben said, just the satirical nature of of. Hell divers too, as it is, and just the fact that it is super Earth already kind of lends itself well to a lot of these like ridiculous, like you, even just like arguments like, hey, it's propaganda, you know, like look at this, you know, great armor, and 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 it's tied to all this other stuff. I think it could be cool. Um, I mean, the the of of the ones that I'm thinking are plausible. Like, it would be cool to see, like maybe like Destiny armor in some way. Like, maybe because I mean that's mm, that's in the PlayStation yeah. family. That's plausible. It's it could technically make sense. I don't know if it would really go any further than that because that the Hell Divers cannot handle <laughs> Destiny level threats at all. So I don't think you're gonna have like the Fallen come in or anything. But I, I do think the armor, like Titan Hunter Warlock t- style armor, would be kind of cool. It wouldn't break the game too much. It would still kind of fit in. There's already capes. So it's you're already mm-hmm. halfway there. Um, Halo's obviously been brought up, which is impossible. But I mean, it's or it's it already is so ODST coded as it is that I don't even I don't even necessarily. I feel like it's kind of already there, really. Yeah. Like a lot of the armor, like there's some armor that's like that's that's an ODST, like straight up, and I I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm generally kind of disillusioned by the idea of crossovers anyway just because i feel like they've lost a lot of their appeal since they've become just the the main way that everything is done we talked a little bit about about godzilla coming to dave the diver and it's like all right i guess i guess this is where we're at i don't even think it's like i don't even think that's bad i just think it's kind of like it's not there there would have been a time where these kinds of things would have been a lot more exciting but now it's like you know oh cowboy bebop's at overwatch and it's like all right 
Excuse Why me. Why not? Sorry, I was sneezing. <clears throat> I would yeah. imagine there's some crossover with like Warhammer, those, you know, those suits. I don't know much about Warhammer, yeah. but yeah, some you, stuff there too. Yeah, some Space Marine. Like I, mm-hmm. I would, at the very least, I would like to see a little bit more color variation, even yeah. if it's not necessarily a straight up collaboration between different IPs. Like even just like if you wanted to do like a, a like a Warhammer 40k style kind of, oh, hey, here's a Warhammer 40k collab. And it's not really a collab so much as it is new sets of armors that kind of look vaguely like Warhammer, but it, they've got like the blue and the gold, you know? Because mm-hmm. um, as it stands right now, I do think the colors are a little bit kind of like, we all, everybody kind of looks, this, there's some, yeah. I don't want to say there's like no variety, but it would be cooler to have a little bit more variation within the squad than than what exists currently but i mean we're still pretty early on in this game i'm sure it's going to look fucking unrecognizable at a certain point all right now we can get to the mission loadouts their preferred mission loadouts i'm curious to see what you guys like to bring with you on your voyages uh dustin let's begin with yeah. you what's your ideal loadout yeah so obviously it depends but i'll tell you my go-to options orbital laser you gotta microwave these boys especially the bugs gotta bring that orbital laser i also this is the masculine urge but the nuke uh the mini nuke is just a lot of fun love having that 500k yeah 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 yeah. oh yeah i love that um in terms of like turrets i'm always bouncing around between like the heavier machine gun we also really enjoy i know brad uses this a lot is the uh the mortar strike the double-edged oh, sword of course because the mortar <laughs> strike is very likely to kill you if you have enemies get too close to you but the mortar strike pretty awesome i'm a bit mixed on the i'm trying to remember what's called ben you probably know the like the drone uh the obama oh, the, the reason dog? we the were done the obama boys which guard dog there's two. Oh, the laser one the laser one yeah the laser guard dog I like the laser guard dog, particularly on bug missions. They're really helpful for clearing out ads, but it's so fucking annoying, especially when someone else's guard dog is just like <laughs> nipping at you. You're like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Stop it. And they're like, so all right, you, they have no control over it. So that and then in terms of uh, secondary weapons, I'm rotate around between the heavy machine gun, the flamethrower and uh, the rail gun. I used to really like the sniper. The sniper rifle is particularly good on the robot missions mm-hmm. where you can zoom in. You got to snipe them in their stupid little fucking face, especially those ones that have the big shields. They got that tiny little face. As long as you, you know, blast, blast them in the face. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I understand. Ben, yeah. yes. what, what are you bringing with you on these various missions to these planets unknown? Again, it, it kind of depends on what kind of mission it is. But as a rule, like a, as a a generality, uh, I w- I'll go with the orbital laser and the 500K, like Dustin said, and then the guard dog rover, the, the guard dog with the laser. Uh, I pretty much will take that all the time if I can. And then I rotate between the stalwart and the flamethrower uh, for my whatever special weapon, unless it's one of the, the missions where you have to close all the bug holes like that's your primary objective and then i'll take the grenade launcher because i'm like you Colin. i can hit those pretty decently from a mm. long distance especially with the grenade launcher yeah i didn't even think about that with the grenade launcher i've never bought i, I unlock all these things but i just i get stuck in my ways and so i don't really yeah i don't, I don't really, do a lot of experimenting either and yeah. i and somebody will be like this is awesome and i'll try it and i'm like yeah but it's not what i know so that's how i felt about the that. lobber in in uh returnal like i was mm. nasty with that thing and everyone hates that weapon and i'm like dude i don't think i would have been able to beat the game without it like <laughs> that's how like vital the lobber was to me chris what are you bringing with you to these planets yeah so obviously it depends but like i've, I've gravitated towards um orbital laser for those for those big for those big armored bugs i like the fact that it tracks it's very useful uh i bring i bring a guard dog rover which i think is the is the laser one mm-hmm. uh with me on and this is all bug missions, by the way. Like the, the automatons require so much specific, specific builds that I'm like, I, I, I don't even have a go to for automaton missions. But so orbital laser, guard dog, rover. I usually bounce between auto cannon and rocket sentry, but it's really just to get to get some some heavy fire because I, I can handle with the liberator and, and and the Uzi. Like I, I don't need to, I don't need a machine gun turret really. Like I, I I got it all set and my impact grenades. I'm fine. And usually for a support, I bounce between 
machine gun and grenade launcher, but I, I, I've, I've been sticking with the grenade launcher just because they're so useful for the bug holes. And also just because my armor gives me two, two extra impact grenades, plus that glitch, which gives me an extra one. So I have seven grenades, seven out of six grenades on person, and I have a grenade launcher with like a, a crazy mag. So I'm, I'm like a demolitions guy, basically. And I'm running out and I'm blowing everything up. I'm, I'm usually the sample guy. I'm usually like running around collecting samples because I, I can, if, if I'm being chased by like a group, I can just throw one grenade and, and be safe. So I'm the guy who cleans up everybody. But like, that's kind of, that's usually the guy. On automaton missions, I don't use the guard dog at all. Like the guard dog is like a no go for automatons at all because to me it's they they ruin like there's some stealth that you can engage in with automatons that I really really fucking I really like, and sometimes the guard dog will just be like, "Hey, mm-hmm. we're over here, pew pew," and it's mm-hmm. like, "Oh, you just fucked everything up," and then the bot, bot drop incoming. So like it's yeah, guard dog no go on automatons, but on bugs I always I always take it. Chris, I, I, you said something. I don't know what it was that made me think. When you take the grenade launcher, does it shoot the specific types of grenades that are in your loadout, or does it just shoot impact grenades? Uh, you know? I, I mean, I use impact grenades, so if right. that were the case, I wouldn't know. Okay. I've only used... I think... The, the, when I shoot the grenade launcher, it's, it's, it's impact grenades. Yeah. Basically. Or at okay. least it feels that way. I gotta test that um, out because I'm curious. Like, if you're using the incendiary grenade, does the ro- does the grenade launcher shoot incendiary grenades? No, I, don't know. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't think it's that. I, actually, I, I don't know. I, I think when I shoot them in the bug holes, they explode immediately. But then I, I have seen them bounce off. So like, I don't, yeah. I don't. I'm not entirely sure what's up with the grenade launcher, but it's it's yeah. it's worked well enough for me uh, in my runs that I haven't questioned too much about it. That would be a cool idea, though, to yeah. have it like absorb the characteristics of the grenades that you have. Right, That'd be sick. Yeah. For me, I uh, well, I guess I'll go with the 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 kind of the bombs I bring first. I the laser. It's funny the orbital laser. I see a lot of people use it. It scares me for some reason. Like I don't want to deploy it because I've died because of it so many times that I'm like I don't want to do this to other people. So I I do. It is the masculine urge. The Eagle 500 k uh, kilo, yeah. kilo bomb is fucking hysterical. I love it. I love throwing that thing and just watching it explode. It's like. There is something about that that speaks deeply, like goes into our brain stem, you know, yeah. that we love it. We love it. And then I also bring the eagle airstrike. It gets a yeah. little dicey, though, having two eagles because you have to kind of send your your like eagle the companion re-arm. away to rearm. Right. And and so you can do that. But I, I, I like doing it manually. I was bringing turrets for a while until I realized like no one at high levels were bringing turrets anymore. Like there's something not interesting about them i guess they're actually good players so i kind of try to just copy that because i usually just bring one with me and usually you would place it somewhere when you're extracting but you wouldn't even use it up to that point so i figured i'd have more explosives with me so i bring those but yeah the uh the eagle like finding a bug nest of several holes and then just dropping the 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 500 kilo bomb on it is hysterical to me and i love that and then i bring i used to bring the rover which shot bullets but then i started bringing the sh32 shield generator pack with me instead which I feel like has really saved my ass. My kill to death ratio would be a lot worse probably without it. So I bring that. And then I personally feel totally naked without the MG 43 machine gun. And maybe that's why I have so many kills is because that is my shit. Like, I just love that thing. I just kneel down to stabilize it a little bit and just fucking carve away. So I really, really love that gun. If I can't get, if we like are shot, it's, it happens more often on the higher levels. Obviously, if you're like kind of shot into the shit immediately and can't get down your weapons before you engage, like I'm like, damn, dude, I'm like at a major disadvantage because I really need that machine gun and yeah. try to take good care of it. Always looking for ammo, refilling it. Because that's one of the cool things that this game does too, is it forces you to, you know, with the exception of like the one load shotguns and stuff, it forces you to kind of eat the ammo. It works realistically if you reload too early. So you really want to manage that and all this. So yeah, the MG 43 machine gun is my, is my shit. And I love that. And it was funny. I want, this is what I want to ask you. We can go around the horn and talk about this is like, who are you playing against? Cause I have to be totally honest with you. I have probably played no more than five automaton missions. Like I don't even, I don't like them that much. Like it, I know it's like, I get really stuck in like this very specific lane often when I play any game. So I know it has to do with that, but I'm like, I just want to play the, the whole bug thing feels more nor like what i want this game to be who i want my adversary to be the logic of it and all of that maybe the kind of companionship to starship troopers in some sense which i like so 
I'm curious if you guys are fighting them both evenly or where you're kind of, I look at it as a two front war. It is it's like the Pacific and the Atlantic in world war two. And it's like, I am engaged over here. I cannot be in two places at once. You know, I'll let you guys worry about that, but I did go check out space Vietnam, which was cool and scary. So Dustin, where are you on yeah. this? Who are you fighting? So if I have a full crew, then we're going to fight the automatons for sure. The issue with, the robots is just that I find that their missions aren't balanced very well. In fact, there was a time for a while where there was something bugged about the escape mission that you would do that. That was like, you know, the robot Vietnam where I was like, there's no way this is right there. This is not anywhere close to the hardest difficulty and we can't get anywhere close on this mission. So I, I I'm finding that if we're not fully stacked with a team, we're going bugs. Uh, just because bugs are, I would say, a little more forgiving. I guess you have a lot more options in terms, I think, of what types of weapons you can bring in and play styles. Whereas when you're going in against the automatons, it's like, OK, make sure you need to have or preferably like a precision weapon like the sniper rifle or something. Um, Chris mentioned some of the more tactical approaches you can do. You gotta be careful because there's like the the thing, there's the generator that gets rid of all of your your ability to call things in. You gotta be careful of that. They're just in general, I think, a lot harder to do. But I think they're really cool. I hope that, and maybe they have because I know they uh, just did that balancing patch, and I haven't played one of those missions since then. So maybe it's been cleaned up. But. Uh, so, yeah, a little bit of both, but more bugs than robots. Where are you at on this, Ben? I think I probably am slightly more bugs than robots. I, I prefer the bug missions. I think part of that is just they're more fun to watch them explode. And part of it is that the robots, in my estimation, are just genuinely harder. But part of that relies, too, on like what your daily mission is. Because if there's a daily mission to, you know, kill a certain amount of robots or something. I'll start there and then I usually end up staying with whatever I'm fighting. Um, but I would agree that the, the robots, it's almost always like if I don't have a full crew of people I'm talking to, I'm not going robots because they do take more coordination. I think, especially the, not the, the little simple ones that you could melee to death, but the, the bigger ones, they take a little more coordination. You got to have somebody kite them while somebody else is shooting them from behind. Like it, it really does make you work together in my opinion. And I just like the bugs exploding way more, but Colin real quick back on your, um, your special weapon. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you've tried the stalwart because I used to be a machine gun main too, until yeah. I tried the stalwart and it's a little less firepower, but you get three clips and you can reload it while you're running around. So I don't know, maybe, maybe oh, I should look, yeah, I'll, I'll have to yeah. look into that. I, I don't know. How do you even try weapons without being in a mission? Do you have to just go you to the don't. tutorial? Yeah, or there's I, like no, there's no place for. I, I I was thinking that like they need like some sort of coliseum, yeah, or something where you can just dick around, yeah, right, yeah. And because I would like to try, there's a bunch of things I'd like to try, but I you you, I just don't want to fuck anyone's game up, you know. Like, I, don't I don't want to fuck my stats for, up too, like by not playing right. well. Like I did, I have had a few of those missions where I've tried to go in with weapons that I don't know, and then I'm like, I'm just fucking this up, you know. Yeah, you don't want to spend half an hour with the the weapon that you hate. I get that. That's sure. good. That is, I mean, that is key is that I would sacrifice like a third of the machine gun strength to be able to load it while I'm moving because yeah. that's a major problem with you the have to like take definitely change my life or not my life, but my my <laughs> game like yeah. it, it change my game. <laughs> Why not? Very well. Um, all right. Let's see here. Chris, what are you uh, fighting? Are you fighting the automatons or the or the bugs? Yeah, I, I would say it's mostly bugs, just not even necessarily because I prefer it necessarily. I think it's I think it's just what we've kind of echoed throughout this in this specific part of the conversation, which is just that they're just easier and it's just a little bit more approachable. And if you can't get a full team like you're going bugs because the automatons will wreck you because they can get you from a distance. They can spot you. They can drop from the sky at like a ridiculous pace. Uh, and they have all these radar jammers. They have cannons on the top of like giant bases that throw shit at you. It's like it's the, the eye of Mordor. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like there have been so many times where it's like I killed. No one's alive. Why am I exploding? Yeah. <laughs> Blow that fucking thing up. How is no one taking care of this yet? Uh, so like it's it's just a lot harder. And, and because and I'm I'm usually especially like, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks, I'm just not really in the in the 
space to really dedicate myself to like a real like okay let's let's hunker down and be like super strategic i, I just want to shoot i just want to shoot bugs and chill you know i'm not i'm not trying to play a destiny raid but i i will say like there are there were times initially like when i had a little bit more time on my hands where like i would be like dude let's do an automaton mission you bring this i'll bring this and and we would sneak the entire the, the entire way around and it was super super fucking satisfying where there was this like one little a little outpost with i think there were two there were two small just two normal robots and then two guys in their little like walker things where you can only hit them from behind it's like okay there's enough of us here where it's like if if we each kind of go on the outside and pick one to pick off at once we can clear this and then just throw a grenade at the last three guys and then we'll be set and so we pinged them it's like i'm i pinged one guy i was like i'm gonna get this guy you get that guy you get this guy you get that guy and then they'll turn around and then i can grab this guy and then we did it and we 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 cleared it in like four seconds and it was like super fucking sad like extra extra satisfying so i don't i don't know like there's an extra layer of satisfaction in the in the automaton missions also there's the the level of intensity there like there is like that vietnam quality where it's like it's just like holy shit shit's really hitting the fan and it's really cool uh but generally if i'm playing it's it's probably going to be bugs just for the sheer approachability of it um or at least that that's how it's been in my experience. And also just some of the objectives on the bug maps I think are a little bit more interesting. Like there there's some uh although I don't know like are, are they on the I don't I don't know I don't know if I've played enough automaton missions with the freedom of exploration enough to know if like the thief shit is even on those missions or not. But I haven't seen them. They are. I I yeah. we've been, we've been wiped out too many times to even get to them. But yeah, I I gravitate towards the bugs out of simplicity. Yeah, because they are the, easier. I've had people say like, "Oh, they're not. They're not easier." It's like you're out of your mind. They are objectively easier on like a, a many many levels. I agree. But, I, I um I almost feel like it's a built in difficulty level. Yeah, in in some sense, which is cool. And um maybe it is kind of like a built in difficulty level. Like that's like the the bugs are like the Nazis and the the robots are like the Japanese. And the Japanese were way crazier. Yeah, mm. I don't. If you took a Marine in, in 1944 and asked them where they'd want to go, they'd want to probably go to Europe, but they didn't. Or this way. You got to go this way instead. <laughs> All right. Um, for me, one, and this allows us to tie into the story and the politics of the game. And I want to, I want to know what you guys think of all of that. But one of the things that I think is cool about fighting the bugs, and I, this is just my own, what I bring into the game myself, is just that in the Starship Troopers book and Heinlein's Starship Troopers book in 1959, one of the fucking craziest things and one of the coolest things Dagan and I went into it on our episode of Knockback about it that I really loved was the bugs are not only sentient, but like technological. They're exactly like what you see in in Helldivers 2, basically, a lot of them, but they build like spaceships and have cities and do science and have manufacturing. And I was like, that's so fucking weird. And I like I like like they even they they bring their spaceships to Earth and attack it, you know, and in this they kind of don't have this is more of the Starship Troopers film, but not even because even they're somehow sentient. But what's cool is that and why I like doing it is that where it's like a war of attrition, basically. And in the book, they talk about it, how they can't kill the bugs because they can't get in the, the whole thing of dropping bombs in the holes comes from the book and the movie, obviously. But like nothing gets low enough. And they have to basically in the book go and they go and try to capture they go into like one of the holes and try to like capture one of the, the what they call the brains and it's just cast based system. And so I like to think there's all this stuff underneath the surface when we're fighting the bugs. You know, automatons feel too literally sentient. They're like Cylons, which is cool in its own way. And I'm sure there's a whole lore over there as well. But one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, and this was brought to my attention, so I, I didn't even really look at it until deeply until people had brought it to my attention. But. Did you read any of the lore like on the on the different planets and the things you find? It's interesting. Basically, it appears that there's like a civil war or like a rebellion brewing with the humans. And a lot of people think that like the third sect might actually be the rebellious humans, maybe even attacking Super Earth or something like that. I wonder if you guys have dug into any of this. Ben, you're shaking your head. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm wondering, we'll start with you. Uh, have you looked into any of kind of the meta story? It's not important, but like there is a whole plot about what I think is suggesting what will happen in the future. 
Yeah, my um my nods were more of a uh affirmation of acknowledgement more than uh, understanding. But I've definitely picked up on a little bit of that. But oftentimes when I have a chance to to read the lore, I'm also running from bugs, so it's very quick. Uh, I dug in a little bit to the wiki, but just a very little bit. Uh, but I do find all that stuff interesting. I and I, I mentioned that earlier. I like the fact that. This game has some lore and there's some like deep underlying themes there that go past the satire. But for the most part, you can take as much of that as you want and leave as much as you want. So I think it's interesting. I don't really. I guess this is not a game. Most of the time, I'm very intent on absorbing story. And this is more of a game where I want to say, oh, hell yeah, a lot uh, and not so much think about that. But I think that it's interesting. I would love to see like, a, you know, some original overwatch style shorts that deal with the lore um, because there's not a whole lot in the game, but uh, I, I find it interesting, but it's not something I've spent a lot of time investing in thinking about for sure. It's funny though. Like what you're saying about being under attack all the time and being kind of in the shit is like, that's almost reading the lore in that context is almost part of it Yeah, where it's like, yeah. it's almost like it's irrelevant because I, let me ask you this, Ben, let me stick with you for a second. How do you read your character? Do you read that you're getting that it's clones of you or do you are you reading that it's literally a new person every time that comes on the planet because it's mm. not clear to me even you're you're obviously cryogenically frozen when you're put onto your ship and then yeah. brought like reanimated or whatever but do you read it as being a new person every time or do you read it as being like a bunch of your clones i have thought about that as far as you mean like when you're reinforced How yeah like works? like yeah you die yeah. you come to the planet you die in 30 seconds it's like okay so now who's the next person is it like a is it like rogue legacy yeah. Or is it like just lives like Mega Man? Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know. I, I guess the, the reality is I don't know. I have thought before, like maybe all of these characters are clones because, you know, pretty much everybody either has the voice one or voice two, male or female, essentially, uh, as far as what they are. But they, everybody sounds the same and you have mostly the same body type. So I've thought about that before. Like, are these all just clones of each other? But I never really... Yeah, I never really thought about it much past that. <laughs> um, I always read it as new people. Yeah, new people. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, is there I any really... indication about it being clones? Like, well, no, I just didn't know. Well, because it doesn't really make like. Well, the only indication is like, why would the person who's coming to replace you be have all of your exact loadout, your exact true, like stats, your exact experiences? That's why. That's why I was wondering if there's like some sort of meta about it being like endless clones. You know? Yeah, mm. yeah. Because um, they do kind too. of show that one. There's like that one shot of the assembly. Of all yeah. of the of all of the cryo freezing, so you could imagine it's both. I I I think I'm not convinced it's one or the other. To be honest, I keep my voice at random, so I have a different voice actor every time. So I think that that adds to my head canon of it not being clones. Like it's a random yeah. soldier. That that setting might indicate one answer being right over the other. Yeah, I, and then every once in a while you get Spider Man is your uh, hell die. Yeah, yeah you're. A, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's I. I don't know. Like, I, I, I definitely view it as different people because the way that I think about it, it's like, what would be like if they could just clone, like, what would even be the need for propaganda in the first place? Like, I, I, I kind of view it as like, there are so many people who are down with this cause that there are just an absurd amount of people who are willing to enlist and able to like fill the void of whenever you. Because I do think the clone, like, I do think the clone thing is possible, but I also feel like it kind of like kind of diminishes the the importance of. The propaganda and in, in yeah, that's view. true. If they, if, if they could just clone everything, that there there wouldn't be really. Why would they even need people to enlist at all? Yeah, that's um, fair. That's a that's a really great point. Yeah, I, I um. Again, because Dustin had mentioned like what suggests that even, and it's like the only thing that suggests that is just the nature of like you you'd have to. There's a lot of games that you have to suspend your disbelief about all sorts of things, but you have to suspend your disbelief in some sense that like you are there's some. It's that's why I asked. It's more like Rogue Legacy. Where you're actually like every life is a different person, you know, yeah. which is which is in and of itself interesting. Dustin, are you interested at all in like the meta story about the rebellious humans and all sorts of weird shit? Have you picked up on any of that? Again, I didn't actually pick up on that until people had pointed it out. But once they did, I started seeing it everywhere. I mean, you if basically if you read like the green documents that you find sometimes, it's like it's like, um, you know, reminder, you're not allowed to do this, this, this or this or like, you know, pay no attention to reports from blah 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 about this and all sorts of things it's it's cool but it, it doesn't have to be there and again reading it in context is funny because it's like who gives a fuck i'm about to die and then you're reading this and kind of imbibing this information so what do you think 
Yeah, I have read a few of those, but it's always too chaotic for me to retain any information of what I'm reading. It's neat. <laughs> I got to say, though, the the lore that I'm more interested in, which I haven't done a ton of research, but I've seen some tweets about it is like theories about the bugs being planted on on different planets in order for an excuse for the hell divers to go and take them over from potential rebellious humans. They're, you know, good psyop. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's so, deep. It's not yeah. unlike what happens yeah. here on Earth, although in a much more simplistic way. <laughs> Chris, are you, are you are you dealing with the story at all? Uh, not to the degree that I've seen a lot, but I, I would I I was nodding because that's the aspect that interested me the most. Dustin as well, where it's just like that that idea of just like I think I read something too. Like I don't know how accurate that is of of just the idea of uh, the bugs being mined for like a, a fuel resource or something, and and that was. Uh, an, an impetus for them and, and i don't remember exactly like what it was but like that there was some implication of that being true too and, and and the idea of them being planted on on uh insurrectionist planets as an excuse for them to go in and fuck shit up it's it that sh- that is a lot more intriguing to me like i think that's really cool i don't know what i don't know what that's really going to amount to in a game like this like i don't know what because there hasn't really been a cut scene you know or like there hasn't really been an implication that there's going to be like a seasonal narrative per se, as we understand it, uh, or as we understand seasonal narratives in games with seasonal narratives as, as they've existed up until this point, like they might do something like a little bit more hands off and a little bit more um, clever, just like the way that they're teasing certain uh, upcoming features to the game and in, in, in the cool way that they're doing. But, you know, I, uh, I like what's there, but I also, like Ben said earlier, like I really do appreciate the fact that it's kind of out of the way and it, it allows you to digest it at your own pace. And even if you want to completely ignore it, that's also valid. And it also is arguably a lot more fitting for the role play of it too. Like there's, it feels like every way you play it is the right way to play it. And that's a great, I I guess until you get into like suicide missions where people are like screaming at you to have certain loadouts or whatever. But uh, before then, there's kind of no wrong way to play it or no wrong way to engage with the world that the game is set before you. And I, I, I think that's a really understated uh, strength of what the game is, is doing. Because if you do want to be like a mindless kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to shoot shit and hoorah. Like that's kind of the point. But then if you also want to think about like, cause there's some, I saw some people like I saw some streams where people were role playing people who were like, uh, starting to question and then they would their friends would kill them mid, yeah. mid game yeah and then they would and then they would drop in and then they would drop it as a new guy and then like when they would drop it as a new guy they would be like all like propagandized and like it, it's just like it's like really there's it's cool like i don't know it's it's there's something really fascinating about the way that this game plays with the world and, and the way that it doles out information to you and the way that it tells its story in, in such a hands-off way that i really i really vibe with and i really like it and, and so there are aspects of it that i'm curious about but i'm not I'm not delving too deep into it until they give me a pretty solid reason to like, I want to, I want to see something in game that blows my mind. And I'm like, well, I have to know what the hell's going on with this. And then I'll, I'll do the proper digging, but why? Well, I, wonder- I, I love the way they're doing it. Oh, I'm sorry. Ben, go ahead. No, I was just thinking about the fact, like what Dustin was saying and what everybody said about the, the humans who are rebelling and, and you see those, um, on the on the loading screen where it gives you the tips, which by the way, my favorite tip that it gives you is, by the way, sometimes tips will be displayed in this space. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. But my <laughs> but the, sometimes the tips are like, if you see somebody questioning something, make sure to report them immediately. And it never really occurred to me that that's you know, that is lore in and of itself. Right. Uh, most most of the tips are just tongue in cheek, but you know there are some there that probably do play somewhat into the the overarching narrative for sure. I'm jealous in some sense of being able to have a game that can be in this. I mean, it's not it's not exclusive to them, of course. And I would argue Fortnite is probably the game that revolutionized like these live updates that hide things in the game and make these mysteries and all the rest. And that's cool. But it's cool that there's like a a, a lore guy there that just deals with like yeah. the in game, like what's going on at any moment and can kind of manipulate and drop things into your game if you want. And like a dungeon master st- style person. And I loved it. And they're beautiful and they're dangerous. But like when the asteroids started like crashing you you get like meteor showers yeah. or whatever and all the was like this is so fucking it's so cool and it really does and i love that you brought up the masculine urge thing because that's that's the way this game feels <laughs> to me in some ways it's just like the, yeah. <laughs> it, it fulfills this really deep primal thing for me in some sense in that way of like this is just 
like my my warrior ancestors or something like times unknown it's just a very interesting game from that perspective what do you guys think about the politics and the way people read into it kind of the connection to fascism my problem with this is and this has really nothing to do with the game but i guess it's just an important note is that i dispute that starship troopers is fascist the book i think and if you read about the movie you know that you know they had kind of an axe to grind with the kind of subject matter and wanted to bastardize it and make it into kind of an obvious propagandistic piece which it is uh, uh, along with the robocop like commercials and all of the rest and and it's, and i think the movie's really good um i just think the book's a lot better and i think the book's more subtle so the only thing i the only reason i bring that up is just the book i don't want to say the book is pro democratic cuz it's not but i don't think it's fascistic and i think people that make those connections go read the book it's really short and it's really good the first chapter is like amazing because it's about like an assault on a planet and they they are almost in, they're in like in the in the book they're in like this crazy armor when they drop in almost like mechs and it's very different than what is portrayed in the movie than is kind of gleaned into the game and so i just encourage people to kind of mix between that because it's not i would like for hell divers to play more with the subtleties of the book you know, and, and I'm not saying that they're they're Starship Troopers book, but the idea of there being deeper kind of context, to everything they've really even ramped up. In other words, the comedy in the other direction where it's even more RoboCop ish than Starship Troopers was. And it's more propagandistic and weird. And so to the point, uh, I, I don't know if it was Dustin or Ben that said earlier, like we need to get these almost animated pieces, like these shorts out and stuff like that. And it's like, I almost wonder if they're like, you're never going to get anything like that. Like the 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 whole meta is in never fully explaining or showing anything even that intro which is really cool that plays when you start the game up was done externally that they didn't even do that internally at the studio at all so um yeah i'm wondering if you guys are like dealing with and of course at dustin i guess also relevant would be the the annoying people in the you know just a small group of people in the community that are like reminder guys you're the bad guys don't have any fun with the fascism and all this and it's like i i just think everyone needs to calm down a little bit on that front what do you think about all of this yeah, it's fucking annoying. The the uh, the people that go around and police people tell them how they should or shouldn't have fun. And yeah, it's it's so silly just because everyone knows who's playing it, that it's stupid. It's designed to be stupid. You're supposed to have fun together being stupid and going around and screaming about democracy and stuff like that. It's like I I, I don't just understand how people are so unhappy. <laughs> they need to go and do shit like that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I don't really know if there's anything more to really say about it other than just like those people. I, I don't know how their existence is so sad because it's not like someone's playing hell divers and then going out and like, what, what would be the, now the, like the, <laughs> the Oh, they're going to start. They're going to like pick up mind comp afterwards. Be like, Oh, not bad or something. Yeah. You know what I mean, it just doesn't before, make it. Before Hell Divers, before Hell Divers, I hated this book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, great it's, it's, read. It really is fucking baffling. Yeah. So it's dumb. Um, but the, of course, there's any t anytime there's a good thing, some moron's gonna go and and say something. But I honestly, I think it's cool how people have a uh, have gone and and kind of made this like pseudo role play community behind it i saw a tweet from the game director he was wearing a hell divers shirt and someone gave him like the the hell divers salute out in public and he was like i didn't know what to do initially so i just <laughs> i gave him the salute back and it was really cool I'm like yeah that's that's fun so um yeah i i don't i'm trying to think if there's any like there's no what possible example could someone take it too far uh I don't know. There's don't just know. Things if you, that if you, listen, if you relate to the bugs in Helldivers, I would just keep that to yourself personally. Mm -hmm. That's that's Absolutely. my yeah. That's my observation. Ben, are yeah. you dealing it? What what do you think about the politics of the game, both internally and externally? Do, are they relevant to you? Or are they interesting? Do you care about like space fascism? It's a there. There is something very natural about those two things going together because you imagine that like to go to space is so hard. It would. It would. Uh, attract strong men that got things done, you know, and and let you go yeah. to the stars. I care a lot about that 
in my life, but zero about it in Helldivers. Uh, because like I said earlier, it's very much just a hell yeah, the game. Let's play with the boys. Let's blow up some bugs. Let's kill some robots. I do think it's funny how it can be interpreted so many different ways because I've seen posts specifically, you know, on social media, Twitter specifically, where people are like, oh, it's so nice to actually have a conservative developer in the industry. And like they're taking like the the for democracy and stuff seriously. And I'm like, do you not understand that satire? And then you get the complete opposite side where it's like they're mocking us They're And it's like, no, it's not that either. So I don't I don't know. Um, it, it's definitely not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. But I, I agree with Dustin. Some people are just never happy. And and um, I just want to kill bugs in the most brutally masculine not to say, you know, non-masculine people can't enjoy the game as well, but uh, I'm going to do it in the most masculine way possible. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to I'm going to shout and I'm going to be Yuri screaming as he's shooting, you know, a thousand rounds out of the machine gun uh, because it's fun. And that's all I want the game to be is fun and comedic and a good time to hang out with friends. That's wow. that's all I need. You sound like a toxic piece of shit. Ben. Yeah, I mean, I am. Yeah. <laughs> You're such a chud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yuri, it's funny Yuri Lowenthal is coming up because I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Remake and Micah had pointed out to me, which I didn't even realize. It's like, oh, Johnny is um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yuri Lowenthal is Johnny. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Now I can't not hear it when yeah. he when he comes onto the scene. Chris, do you associate yourself more with the automatons or the bugs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the automatons. Yeah. <laughs> what do we know anything about them? Like, is there any lore about them? I don't know so much about that side. Like, I are they? I- yeah, I think there is. There I is. haven't looked into it because I, I, I feel like I know too much about the bugs already. I kind of I kind of want to keep some air of mystique around the. Yeah, I understand that. Is there some I, I there like, must, is there a conspiracy with them, too, or something? The, or? I don't know. If yeah, there's conspiracy. There's some. Go ahead, Dustin. I was going to say I heard I, I think it was Jimmy that told me. So yeah. if he's full of shit, then sorry. Yeah. But he was saying something that there's like theories about they were created by hell divers to fight in the war. And they were like. The robots were like, yeah, these guys kind of suck. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to we're going to do our own thing. And you can look so at they're like Cylons. Really, yeah, yeah. They uh, I'm trying to I'm looking at, at the the guide. Origins are a mystery, but their unthinking hatred of freedom makes them a threat to all. Citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Please so know that good. attempting to discover the origin of the automatons is a crime against super earth. Manage democracy and freedom. <laughs> this is in the Helldivers guide. So the guide or the uh, this wiki on fandom is in lore Dude, is like, I, you know, in character. I love I love it. I love that aspect of it, man. Like, it's just like, yeah, they hate freedom. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it, it, look, there is something there is something inherently political about it, because I remember growing up hearing that. You know what I mean? It's totally. obviously that's not like. Obviously, that's not literally true, but like yeah, it's like the I most love, nonsensical argument. It, it makes, makes no sense, but I, I believed it. It's yeah, no, I it's it's truly insane. But I love the way I love that it doubles down on that. And I, I love that it's just playing with it. I think there's something I don't know. I, I find it not maybe cathartic is the wrong word because I don't necessarily think it, it, it. I don't think that's the right word, but like there's something about. I don't know. uh this long after so many tumultuous conflicts to have a a piece of popular media ki- media kind of lampooning this idea in in a way that's fun and engaging is just it's it feels fresh and i, I don't know i i like it i, I don't i don't really understand why politics is this um playground that people are not allowed to inhabit or not allowed to play with, especially with like art and games and narrative and satire. It's just, it's, it's, it's very, I find it strange that like, dude, even just this, this is very separate, but like even just the other, the other day I saw like this thing on Twitter where it's like somebody brought up like, I think Bioshock infinite and some other, some other game or, or, Oh yeah. Wolfenstein is like games that portray white people as bad. And it's like, Oh my God. (laughs) why can't we just play games and like actually engage with them instead of like only engaging with the the most surface level nonsense that isn't even it's so stupid like i really hate the conversation going around generally around games and and politics but bioshock infinite that's so interesting because remember remember the original arguments about infinite were that it was racist against black people 
Mm-hmm. Right, because Daisy Fitzroy was right. the uh, was an antagonist. Yeah, it's 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 a, dude, man, it's a pendulum, man. It's just like yeah. it's a fucking horseshoe. It swings and it's like now it's here and now it's there and it's time is a flat fucking circle. Annoying. Yeah. All right. A um, couple more things I wanted to ask about as we move forward. I, I forgot to ask this question earlier because I wrote it in, in my handwritten notes, and so I uh, I probably should have asked it way earlier. But I'm curious what everyone's ship's name it is. Um, or what our ship's names are. Do you guys remember off the top of your head? I, I mine is the yeah. distributor of independence, which I think is uh, strange. Doesn't really make any sense. But uh, Dustin, what's your ship name? I I changed it, and I remember what the change name is, but it changed back like it was bugged. But my what I want the ship title to be is the Princess of Family Values. Uh, <laughs> was my my ideal name. Family it's like Values. something stupid right now, like Justice, the Prince of Justice or something. But Princess of Family Values. I was like, I'm trying to find the most ridiculous combo here and that that would be it but i think it was bugged for a while ben i can't remember for a hundred percent but i'm pretty certain it's princess of wrath prince yeah princess <laughs> a is a good princess. one that's a good <laughs> chris do you remember yours yeah i i i, I remember it specifically because i was like oh that's so cool that you can do this because it's already it's already so steeped in these vibes anyway but uh i i named mine the the prophet of truth which I was like, oh, yeah. shit, you can do this? <laughs> Perfect. Cool. Um, all right. I guess as we exit, I'm curious uh, where we leave it, uh, where you guys kind of believe it, where, what your future plans are with Helldivers 2 and what you may want from the game in the future that will keep you more engaged. Because I do think that, the, and we didn't talk very deeply about, pl- we've talked so much about playing the game and the momentary you know, the moment to moment gameplay and that the storytelling is in the gameplay and that it's always about fun and delightful and scary and amazing moments. It, it really does continue to delight and surprise. There's always just a new thing, you know, like I can't believe I survived that long or the idea of like getting down to one person and no lives left and you have to kind of like kite around waiting for you to get one person back so you can get them into the mission and then kind of change the odds in your favor and then kind of kite around more and then get a third person back in and, and revive yourself and get all the way through the mission like from the very brink there's a lot of cool moments like that but we've talked a, a great deal about that instead what i want to kind of close on is um what will keep you coming back for more and what you will be doing i guess with the game as it is right now because I, I again i do recognize that it is a little repetitive like i i have a lot of fun with it but there are times where i'm like this is the same thing over and over and over again so at some point it's got to give and I don't know how much how much more. I, but at the same time, I turn on my PS5 and half the time I'm going to play something else. And I'm like, yeah, I'll just go play Helldivers. <laughs> so um, so Dustin, talk to me about this. What's the future with you and Helldivers too? Yeah, I'm happy to put it on break for now in that it's like the the curve of enjoyment. Like if you think about by the end of eating two pizzas, you don't want to eat any more pizza. Mm. But you'll be glad to eat pizza again in the future when you're hungry again. And uh, that's where I kinda, I'm, I'm happy playing Rebirth. I jumped in a few times since Rebirth came out, but I really want some balancing updates because the last few times I played, and this was just like by circumstances that I was getting frustrated with the game in general and like particularly certain missions. I was like, man, I, I was a little annoyed that the railgun got uh nerfed the way it did which i just need to use it on unsafe mode i know that that's a feature but i haven't tried it so i need to do that and uh what i really want i want the warthog i want the land uh vehicle that's i mean the 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 mech is awesome don't get me wrong but i want to ride around with the boys with the chain gun on the back and i eventually want to just see the number one thing i want i think they're going to build up to this eventually is you're going to fight on super earth why is Super yeah. Earth selectable if you weren't eventually going to fight there? And the moment that happens, I'm sure I'll be back before then because I'm sure they'll lead up into that uh, for a while. But definitely want to fight on Super Earth and some other interesting locations and other enemies. Ben, future of you and Helldivers 2. You've put the most time in of all of us, so I wonder where you stand. Yeah, I'm still enjoying it. It's very much, especially right now with Rebirth uh, taking up most of my time it's very much a game where like you know on the weekends i'm hopping in playing an hour or two or you know a full mission set with with the guys and and playing a little bit there i'm assuming that'll continue to be the case you know now that the 
when the new uh, when the mech dropped, I hopped in for a you know a night and played. And when when the new War Bond came out, I hopped in to check it out. And uh, I definitely have put in less time in the last you know three weeks than I did in the first three weeks that it was out. But I think this is a game where you know when they add in like new environmental things again. Uh, I'll hop in. I want to check that out. When they put in new stratagems, definitely want to come and see what that's all about. If they bring a third faction to the game, I definitely want to hop in and see that. Oh, so, yeah, there's a whole side of the map that feels like it's begging for it. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely thinking that, you know, this is going to be a game where I'm, you know, it's not going to be my my nightly, every, you know, every night kind of thing, but it's something that I... I feel like I could I could stand three or four nights in, in a week of hopping in for a full set of missions um, and, and hanging out. And, you know, it's got everything I want. I'm not I'm not asking for more, but I know that when more hits, I'm going to want it and I'm going to want to play it. And I'm going to experience it and enjoy it. So it's um it's the perfect set for me. And honestly, right now, if the game just like completely turned to shit and I didn't enjoy it anymore, I still had like, you know, 50 in game hours for my $40 that I will never feel like I got taken advantage of. Like it's, it's been a great experience and I'm, and I've loved it and I'm not asking for anything more, but I think there's a lot more that I'm going to enjoy in the future. And, and and again, I am, I I love single player games, but I do play a lot of multiplayer games. And a lot of that is because I do tend to be more, a more social gamer and enjoy hanging out with, with buddies. So for me, it's always going to be like, you know, my, our Dustin and I's friend, Brandon, he has zero interest in rebirth right now. And I still want to hang out with him and talk to him every now and then. So, you know, a couple of times a week when he wants to to hop to look, like, can we play something? I'm like, yeah, let's play Helldivers because that's the easy decision. That's the fun decision. That's the one I can go into without a lot of consequences and getting too frustrated. Um, and they did Dustin drop the new balancing patch that a lot of the things that night we were all playing and got really frustrated. Yeah. Uh, that fixed a lot of that stuff. Oh, nice. Um, so it's not perfect and it won't be perfect. As long as they keep adding new stuff to the game, it won't be perfect. But I'm happy that they're continuing to work on it. And I think as long as they continue to to try, I'm going to be very forgiving because as much communication and work as they put into to the game after release, uh, that just makes me want to play it and, and reward them in that way. So, yeah. Chris, uh, are you going to continue your experience with Helldivers 2? Are you ready to move on for the time being? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm definitely eager to get back into it. I've just had a lot of extra work that's kind of pulled me away and so like i see like all all my friends are like level like 25 or like 30 and i'm like god i want to i want to i want to catch up in some way so like i do I, I do think it's going to remain like a staple of my week at the very least um even if it's just once a week just to jump hop on with some friends or just to see what's up i know i'll definitely like pop in a lot more consistently once there's like proper you know big updates like 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 uh, ben was saying like if, if they add big new things new stratagems new faction for sure i'll be checking that out but uh for now i'm i'm happy just making it just a small part of my week if if whenever i get a text from some of my friends be like hey you trying to get on and like yeah absolutely but i do want to i want to move on to some other games at the very least uh which i think i'll have time for at this point i have to say like i would maybe be i've embraced this game a great deal but I would be down with playing it with conceiving to play it not all the time, but on a weekly or twice weekly or three times weekly basis for a period of time. But I feel like there's some danger to that. Like I, I have just as a professional and like as someone who needs to play games and have a breadth of understanding of something, like I always like to be playing something different. It's yeah. it contrasts a great deal with and really conflicts with the, what I usually get into with games and it is proving to be a major distraction in that front. So I do feel like I need to be a little bit more disciplined, like maybe even delete it off my console for a while just to make it not trivial to get into it. Not that it's like that much of an addiction, but it, it really is one of those things where it's like, ah, uh, I'll just literally just play this for a little while. And then I just play it for five hours and then I've lost that entire, <laughs> that entire night, especially because you can't really play it briefly. Like uh, usually mm-hmm. it's going to take you more than 30 minutes to get through one mission. And that would be fairly quick. So, um, but yeah, to, to close out, I just I want to congratulate Arrowhead and Sony for whatever it's worth. I think that they did a really amazing job here. I think this is a really awesome game. And when they have more to say about it, I guess we'll talk about it again. We'll, we'll obviously bring it up on Sacred if we want to and what we're playing. But I think we're kind of through, yeah. you know, really spending. We've I, we've dedicated. I would say we've spent 
in some sense, more time talking about this game than almost, almost any game that has come out and that we've played, including this yeah. podcast, just on the other show. So don't want to become a Helldivers yeah. 2 podcast. <laughs> um, was someone saying something? I thought I heard something. Nope, that was Chris laughing. Oh, ha. <laughs> <laughs> all right time to go by the way guys thank you for your patience i have to get back outside now well, i have to well, i'm going to meet with ben for a few minutes about the live show which is going to be interesting so just a few questions but i was outside working like i was like i'm gonna mow the lawn and i was looking at the time and all this and i haven't mowed the lawn this year yet so my battery was like had some weird like it looked like it was fully charged but it wasn't and then i had to charge it again so it fucked up my whole flow and my my yard still that's why I was 15 minutes late today and so I appreciate that thank you but my yard's still a mess right now like just with I have to still blow it and all that it just just a little snafu like that threw my entire situation off so I still have to get back out there which is a bummer I left my garbage can outside as a sign to the neighbors that I wasn't actually going to leave it like this yeah um all right um my friends let's go around the horn say goodbye to everyone Dustin goodbye see you soon on sacred symbols goodbye yeah just wrapping up things this week I think I'm re- almost recording every day and then it'll be time to head to New York City actually but when this comes out I will be in New York City that day that Saturday so yeah looking forward to it can't wait yeah we're going we're going to come up Saturday afternoon I think and then uh so we'll all convene there it'll be very exciting um Ben goodbye to you I'll talk to you after this goodbye. of course but I won't mm-hmm. otherwise I don't think see you again yeah until the live show yeah, as Dustin mentioned, when this releases, I will be I'm in my normal life, usually a nervous wreck. But Saturday uh, <laughs> will be the worst day for me to be nervous about the show. And then Sunday, I just go into do it mode and then I'm fine from there on out. And then after that, it's on to the next one. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing you guys in person. And um, don't forget to protect democracy and spread liberty. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on to the next one. On to Cincinnati, as Bill Belichick would say. That's right, Cincinnati. Yeah. Chris, goodbye to you. We'll see you on Sacred Symbol shortly. Um, yeah. And uh, be well. And uh, anything to say in closing? Uh, no, man. I, I think, I don't know, just talking, it's it's so strange talking about this game because, like, I haven't really put that, men, that much time into it in the last couple of weeks because I've been working on some other stuff. But just talking about it has made me want to <laughs> jump jump into it the second we're done recording. So I think I might just do that. Uh, nice. I don't know who I don't know if I know anybody who's on right now, but but uh, yeah, I'm I'm probably gonna put some more time into it. I I also I'm starting up uh, remake again because I've been hearing too many good things about Rebirth, and I was like, okay, all right, fine, I'll I'll put my time in and I'll do it and I'll jump jump from remake into rebirth so i'm gonna put some time into that too but yeah i'm looking forward to it. really really excited about new york in general pumped great yeah me too we'll talk more about that on the regular show which would have already gone live by the time we publish this but we haven't recorded it yet in our timeline in our specific timeline speaking of different timelines with final fantasy 7 all right yeah let's get the hell out of here my friends be well thank you for your time thank you all out there for your love kindness and support appreciate you over here on patreon patreon.com slash last day media um We'll talk about these. You know, I, I didn't want to do game specific conversations and kind of leave them to Brad. But I think this sort of conversation is more what I want to do when necessary with some bigger um, releases and have just a different group of people on if necessary to talk about, you know, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I want to get into at some point because I'm like you, Chris, I'm playing remake right now myself again. Just uh, but I'm yeah. again, I should be I should be long done with it. It's just again, it's the Helldivers disease. <laughs> Um, that I've been infected with. All right, let's get the hell out of here. We'll see you next time. Till then, goodbye. See ya. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.